the the main thing is is that whatever I do, uh, to the extent that I can, I stick with it. I'm anti-change. So when you formulate something and you get your measurements and you've you know beaten up an idea that you had that doesn't work, and you come to one that does, uh, hold a constant. And he said effectively that um, the biggest problem that he had, while food safety is important and generally temperature uh, and, and measurement is, uh, the, the real uh, problem was in hospital-acquired infection. So what we saw was that the employees were circulating uh, disease uh, and that would be the common cold, influenza, and things like that. And that could actually hop off into uh, the uh, into the patient. So this world called NCITs, which is non-contact infrared thermometry, uh, we became an NCIT without really realizing it. Those are the things that when you go to the doctor, they uh, they either shoot your head or they have a little Laser. Uh, device. You know, you'll see people do that. You'll see people go around the neck and up and around. Uh, it just leads to uh, a variation in, uh, in what those temperatures are. So what we did is uh, we algorithmically and using an AI algorithm, which AI kind of means we don't know exactly how it works. We can just prove that it does. And, uh, and we did that with PCR testing. Welcome to the Digital Health Transformers, a podcast series where we explore the dynamic world of healthcare innovation, one conversation at a time. I'm your host, Bryce Barger, and today we have an awe-inspiring guest at the forefront of transforming the healthcare landscape. Today, our guest is someone who has worked in the workplace wellness for more than a decade has extensive experience in this space. He is Rick Heller, currently the president of Wello. Rick founded Wello with the mission of stopping the spread of life-threatening infections. His vision and knowledge in this space has led to the development of the, of the innovative product of Wello, Wello Station X, which we will go over today. Rick also holds various patents and product license, including automatic test equipment, indoor location systems, and temperature logging across facilities. He has also pioneered one of the first RFID products while working as CTO in FreshLock Technologies. Today, Rick will share with us his journey, his insights on wellness at the workplace and stopping the spread of infections. Thank you for joining us today, Rick. How are you this morning? Well, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, Rick, you started your career as an engineer, uh, and then you entered healthcare. Would you mind sharing with us your journey, your inspiration, and and kind of what that uh, kind of what that transition was like? Uh, my pleasure. Uh, I don't often talk about myself. In fact, probably uh, never have on this line of questioning. But uh, but that's a, a good question, and I got to think about it in the past days. Um. I was able to merge my interest in health with my passion for academic disciplines. And I'm a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering. I happen to have some uh, MBA uh, behind me. And um, so my uh, health interests really began around uh, performing sensing around running and biking. So here I am doing uh, computer architecture, uh, firmware design, and uh, uh, basically, it became uh, coding and uh, and some hardware design uh, back in the day before the internet. And uh, measurement turned out to be the bridge between what I suspected and uh, what actually worked. So uh, you know, you could have a theory, and then you need to back it up with measurement. So most of what I think is uh, I think about is quickly undone by measurement. And then I get a new way of thinking, and it's something I can uh, build on. And so when it comes to any kind of project management, including companies, measurement is, of course, management. So that's uh, that's my uh, uh, my words of wisdom right now. Since the only way I would ever test these ideas would be by human subjects. So I gave myself informed consent as uh, clinical people will uh, will get a laugh at. 
and I commenced a human experiment, and in particular on myself. So um, my own road to health and the epidemiology started as my first years at UT Austin, believe it or not, in uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts in acting. And acting, which doesn't seem like what, the beginning of any road to what I'm doing now, it has a side benefit that I recognize more today. Uh, you know, with politics in the air, the uh, skill of trying on other ideas, which is what uh, at least good acting is today, uh, called, uh, you know, of, of many different names. But needless to say, it, it helps a lot in marketing um, in our attempt to not just assume what thought leaders in your market are thinking, but attempt to fully embrace or be one. I know that's uh, the end of my acting talk here. Uh, so anyway, it shapes thoughts for uh, for uh, periods of time. Could be an hour, a day, a sentence. Uh, and with that, I uh, try to uh, even use this in jumping around with political ideas that are uh, far from my own. And um, anyway, that's actually a hobby. So uh, acting ended when I met a girl, this is at University of Texas, now my dear wife of umpteen years, I switched my brain quickly to math, electrical engineering, and ultimately got a degree in electrical engineering and computer architecture. I still had no boundaries as to what I wanted to do with it and or uh, any desire to specialize in one thing over another, but by uh, uh, Bioengineering was interesting to me, but still not in play. Uh, but soon, with all that ex human experimentation again on myself, you know, I started shifting not to individual health, but to population health. And that is a very, uh, a very different idea and way of thinking. That is clinical. What is wrong with me? What is wrong with you? To the population. How did this stuff get into the population and how and why does it spread and how can we ultimately uh, stop it? So I dove deep uh, back in uh, fifth grade to a project I, I did on disease and sickness, in particular diphtheria, had a little placard and, uh, you know, wowed the class. Maybe I couldn't say for sure. So from self-study, uh, what I learned gave me a basis in knowing what was likely and what was not in the matters of epidemiology, particularly disease spread. That's, that's very so interesting. My passion, so really, pardon? So really been so it's really almost been in your uh, a passion for kind of almost your whole life in a way. You all the way back to did you say fifth grade that you pulled that project out? Yeah, uh, fifth that grade, and it was about the time that uh, my cousin came down. Just to give you a little anecdote here, that was very. Tell, uh, compelling to me, I uh, came down from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. So I didn't have anything but a, a interest in math and science. Uh, and we were playing ping pong and I, I stopped the ping pong game I was playing. And I said, you mean to tell me if you could, if I could tell you the velocity of this ball and the position of this ball, I would know where it landed. Well, that was something that I had never thought of. And immediately uh, my mind went to telling the future. So yeah, if I could stop everything. Off. Yeah. So <laughs> if I could stop everything, get a measurement, I could tell the future. Uh, it turned out he went into weather, which is very much what that's all about. <laughs> yeah, and, very uh, much. Weather, uh, weather predictions. Yeah, that's funny. That's very interesting. It is. Um, and, and, what we know from weather is you got about two or three days and then it's not all that accurate either. <laughs> yes. Yes, for sure. I always um I always like to joke a joke with my dad and say, man, if we if we could only be a weatherman, you'd only have to be a right uh right 60% of the time. But um uh so you know as you as you kind of um broke into Wello and started to um, curate this brand and this this um, innovative company. What are some maybe what are some unique challenges that you faced um, while, while kind of getting Wello um, off the ground? 
Well, um, you know, the the main thing is, is that whatever I do, uh, to the extent that I can, I stick with it. I'm anti-change. So when you formulate something and you get your measurements and you've, you know, beaten up an idea that you had that doesn't work and you come to one that does, uh, hold a constant. And you can ask my team, we're, uh, uh, we're consistent over the years on that. And in particular, Wello, which obtained an FDA clearance in 2018, uh, well before COVID, uh, after yeah. Ebola breakout. As you know, I'm in Dallas, Texas, and that's where Ebola came from. So um, <clears throat> the most incarnations that we've been through is three large inventions, and that's over uh you know, about 10 years a piece. So uh, the real challenge was to uh, find out who needed this. And and not only who needed this, of course, who would, who would pay for it and where it would actually uh, be able to uh, save lives. So the challenge is uh, ultimately when you have a product that works, is, you know, what is the market uh, who is having uh, pain that this can, uh, this can help rid? In so kind of, um, you know, getting into some of the technologies that you guys have created um, at Wello um, and even your past kind of your your past work at Freshlocks that we kind of touched on briefly. Um, could we get into some of those technologies you guys have have started to uh, develop at Wello and at in a, in a, uh, companies like Freshlock in the past? Yeah, um, Freshlock, we put networks all over hospitals. This goes back to 1998, where we actually had a portal and we were doing it in restaurants and we were putting this uh, sensors and wireless sensors uh, and feeding this thing called the internet. Uh, and uh, with that, we would just log temperatures. And of course, you know that temperatures are very important in food safety. You know, we study uh, pasteurization, and particularly Louis Pasteur, who saw, you know, what it is to, uh, what it takes in temperature to denature things, uh, basically kill uh, living things in your food. So, um, so uh, with that, we, uh, we went into hospitals and into one very large system, uh, uh, we'll go nameless right now, but um, probably hundreds of uh, hospitals we were in. And these went to sensors that were in the room, uh, in refrigerators, in uh, the kitchen, uh, all over the kitchen and hospitals, and then ultimately in uh, things that held tissue, uh, things that shook, uh, shook uh, some salves for uh, anything from oncology to whatever, but they needed to have proof that they were holding this at uh, proper temperature. So it was ID merged with measurement and uh, and that became Freshlock Technologies. The uh, real issue came up when um, I was talking to the CEO of another very large hospital system that was using our uh, using our networks. And he said effectively that um, the biggest problem that he had, while food safety is important and generally temperature uh, and, and measurement is, uh, the, the real uh, problem was in hospital acquired infection. So, you know, when you look into this, you see just the scariest things of, you know, antibiotic resistant uh, bugs and things like that. Some of them take lives in the day or within hours of getting it, but those are the, the very few. And it has to do possibly with the fact that we overuse antibiotics, which is a clinical problem. That's very interesting because it turns into the epidemiological problem. So what uh, we looked for was the tell of a person that was sick. And we weren't interested, if, and please excuse how harsh that comes off, but we weren't interested in patients. We were worried about the people who were around the patients. Patients stand still, you do the, you can do the engineering budget on that and you can see that they don't move, they don't walk, they don't uh, leave the room, but 
other people do. So what we saw was that the employees were circulating uh, disease uh, and that would be the common cold, influenza, and things like that. And that could actually hop off into uh, the uh, into the patient. That patient who got sick uh, in uh, the world of today, Medicare and uh, and insurance reimbursement and things like that, you cannot, as a hospital, um, charge for that. In fact, they penalize the hospital virtually penalized by requiring that a person, a patient that gets a hospital-acquired infection, uh, the hospital is, re is responsible for 100%. And that's all top line that moves to an expense of uh, bottom line. So you can imagine the uh, various different things we did. And what we found was body temperature, and this is going into the bio, uh, into physiology, body temperature was the first, um, uh, the first tell uh, that somebody was getting sick and body temperature obviously elevates. So the problem with this is, and even to today, that we think about this thing called fever and we think that this is a, uh, this is a curse. And the fever is a response. It is in no way a curse. And, uh, you know, even uh, many clinical internists will tell you, do not treat fever. And that's the whole idea behind uh, aspirin. Aspirin lowers your temperature. Uh, obviously, ibuprofen and other ones. Uh, the much more mild uh, is uh, Tylenol, which has a separate, works on a separate different uh, uh, COX inhibitor system. Than all the other ones. So anyway, that's uh, that's what we learned. And I can tell you that the greatest uh, interest that really pulled us along was finding out the 98.6 Fahrenheit, which was that thing we learned in elementary school, that is not human mean temperature. And why that's so important uh, to know is that when we measure at 100.4 and tell people you're contagious, we miss 95% of the infections. Of the infection window. Wow. Wow. So when so obviously when COVID, you know, came into um the Americas and it became such a, a worldwide ep epidemic, what was how how did Wello how did Wello's temperature readings, how did that um, how did how did your business uh, handle that? How how did it fit perfectly in that? Well, um, a good question. So this world called NCITs, which is non-contact infrared thermometry, uh, we became an NCIT without really realizing it. Those are the things that when you go to the doctor, they uh, they either shoot your head or they have a little Laser. Uh, device. Yeah, right, and okay. so. Um, and that technology, by the way, is developed by uh, an acquaintance of mine uh, who also developed the air, air thermometer, which is not gaining as much favor as the most basic, which is the uh, non-contact. And uh, But what we did is we automated it. So the, what we found out in the case of Ebola, and remember, we became very experienced with Ebola and our product because Dallas was going to be the center of the transmission of Ebola. Right. So and, when the, uh, when when those nurses or was it, it was the nurses or doctors that came back um, from Africa that they they landed in Dallas was it? Am I correct on that? In my my memory. Uh, yes, you are. It was actually a worker, um, worker. and I think they he was a Federal Express worker or something like that. Oh, okay. Uh, emigrated here uh, was uh, clean coming in, and then spiked a fever within a few days that got up to 106, and this is reported, uh, maybe it was 104. And what they, he went to the emergency room finally. And in the emergency room, they uh, diagnosed him uh, with Ebola and then sent him out. Uh, actually, I can't say that they said it was Ebola, but I'm pretty sure because he was West African, it was well known at the time. And then they uh, used antiparetics and it was probably a uh, ibuprofen or something strong that uh, lowered his temperature and they released him at about 100.3 degrees Fahrenheit. So they released into the world uh, a <laughs> contagious person. 
And by the way, the drop that you get from uh, uh, from these antipyretics, uh, it's uh, it it will you will be shedding virus as greatly as the temperature that you started at, and that's wow. what's so interesting about body temperature. That is that is very interesting. So getting kind of getting into health technology and the spread of this kind of the spread of infections, you have obviously a very extensive knowledge about stopping the spread of infections, disease, and you must have worked on multiple, obviously you've touched on a couple of these technologies. Um, could you share with us your experience of, um, of, of Skywello? Oh, uh, yeah, Skywello was when we were doing uh, the temperature measurement throughout hospitals under the uh, auspice of uh, uh, Fresh Lock Technologies, which by the way is the same company as Wello. We just uh, changed the name. Yeah, and so uh anyway what we did with sky Wello, it's a really beautiful well-designed product uh, if i may say so we had a design company do it and it's a device you put up in the ceiling and it's over steam tables and you know those tight places where uh restaurants do all their good work and uh it had actuators uh very simple uh, actuators and a distance sensor that had a very narrow uh, field of view so it could actually look at just the uh, surface temperatures of these uh, things. So people would know to stir, the taking a ladle and sort of stir it so they make sure that everything is a consistent temperature, which is important just for food, uh, the art of uh, food preparation itself. So that became a uh, 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 we at the time laid out a uh, like a CAD like picture of the table, and we reported on all those temperatures. And we can also do the complicated formula of food safety with regard to how long uh, it takes to get it to temperature, how long it can stay at temperature, how low it can go once it gets to that pasteurization, and for how long before it either spoils, uh, which means tastes bad, or actually could uh, harbor disease. <laughs> Okay, very interesting. What I guess kind of yeah. getting into, um, you know, how do we stop? You know, if it, we saw how hard it was with COVID, where it just ran rampant, and next thing you know, it truly took over the entire world. Um, what healthcare technologies do you think could put a stop to such a spread, and maybe maybe not such a spread as far as this COVID after it got so widespread, but maybe in the beginning, if we would have had some of these technologies, do you think there, do you think um, there are technologies out there that could help that? Or do you think there are roadblocks in kind of implementing those technologies? Well, I, I, that's a lead in I, uh, to what we're about to do in two weeks. And I don't know if we talked about this, uh, whether or not we did, thank you for the question. Uh, what we've got, uh, is a completely different look at this all through mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, all through the uh, peephole of temperature, and what we did with our 15 million scans of human temperature, and in particular about 30,000 scans from one particular uh, place, um, we have actually been able to crack the code for. Uh, what a uh, so-called fever, we don't call it fever, we just call it elevated temperature, what that actually is. So if you're a 97.7 person, you're going to have a temperature, and we don't use arithmetic like I'm about to use, but if you're a 97.7, which most of us are, uh, you're going to be contagious in the 98.9 area. So what you can imagine is between 98.9 and 100.4, we have some great uh, charts and analysis on this. Uh, you know, in that space is contagious people coming to work using our product, and our product is passing it as our customers have to follow some uh, guidelines, which typically have to be CDC, which says 100.4 is what you can send people home to. And so we're done with that. Um, that is, as I said before, hopefully, is that 5% of the spreaders is all you catch there. And um, you'll see these things at airports that usually doing tests and trials no longer. Uh, they don't have any uh, possibility of an FDA approval, even the company FLIR, FLIR, 
who makes these infrared cameras early on in COVID said they cannot be used to assess human temperature. They're plus or minus two degrees C, which is about plus or minus four degrees F, which you can imagine you know, is everything range. between well and very yeah. sick. So, uh, and, and we did some work with the people who passed through Dallas Love Field that were working behind uh, the, the TSA uh, yeah. stations. And those people were working at Kentucky Fried Chicken and all the various different uh, vendors uh, in the back. And we would stop them. Uh, would they have a fever? And we found quite a few. But then somebody set up for Southwest Airlines and screened, uh, I believe, about 2 million people and never found one fever. So uh, we knew we were onto something. And so this new thing that we have is just an AI piece that we inject into our uh, station. And remember, our station is very precise in that it gets you to uh, to cite yourself perfectly. You can't do that by teaching a receptionist how to, you know, how and where to do that by these uh, devices that are contact devices. You know, you'll see people do that. You'll see people go around the neck and up and around. Uh, it just leads to uh, a variation in uh, in what those temperatures are. So what we did is uh, we algorithmically and using an AI algorithm, which AI kind of means we don't know exactly how it works. We can just prove that it does. And uh, and we did that with PCR testing. So the genetic testing that was done at this one site was for people who were uh, symptomatic or even asymptomatic. And it depended on uh, the reason that they would do that. And we merged that together uh, with the algorithm. And we determined what the uh, normal range for a person could be uh, independent of a fixed temperature and what the uh, out of range is. In other words, they could go a little above normal and it could be due to uh, all sorts of things, uh, none uh, related to health. Sometimes <laughs> we saw Adderall in a case or two uh, spike a little bit of temperature, but never out of range. And with those outliers, uh, we were able to identify who are likely contagious. So the answer to all this, um, because there's this incredible, it's almost political interplay between uh, things like uh, mandates for vaccine mandates for masking and all that. Uh, what we determined is about one in a hundred people are likely contagious. A little more when it's uh, epidemic is in full bloom and a little less um, when you know we're in the spring season and uh, there's not a lot of it. And so, uh, that is, uh, the answer to that is, is that when you come to work and if you're likely contagious, and I mean not extremely high, which is rare, um, right. you will be asked to wear an N95. And N95 is, you know, standard face covering, a little better than a cloth mask uh, that we provide. And, uh, and we, now we're looking at, instead of telling 100 people, everyone, they need to wear a mask all the time, we're only focused on that one person who's likely contagious. For that, we will get a 95% reduction in the uh, what's called the disease burden in the workplace. Uh, so no spreading, very yeah, little. Is, and I know that that's obviously a huge kind of illness and wellness in the workplace is, is now, of course, since COVID and beforehand, but really since COVID is very focused on now, whether that's mental health or whether that's just your, 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 your regular, Hey, are you, Hey, are you sick? Um, you know, and that's very crucial to a lot of companies that are looking to bounce back after COVID and keep their, keep their employees, you know, um, healthy and happy. Can you recommend strategies, um, that could help maintain occupational health and safety for kind of employees' well-being? Well, um, yes, and I uh, sort of did. I'll elaborate yeah. that um, in the space. Uh, say again? Yeah, so I know you just mentioned that with being able to kind of have them um, – test and kind of hone in on that smaller number of individuals instead of saying, hey, everybody needs to wear a mask to the smaller individuals. Are there any other um are there any other strategies that we could that we can also help follow? Well 
you know, I, I have to say that there are, I want to say there are not, except mm. for uh, what I just explained. Uh, but, you know, surveys um, or, uh, seem to be important. We have a survey on our uh, device. You can take the survey, survey and take your temperature. But surveys are the honor system, and we find it has about uh, the efficacy of uh, temperature screening in the, uh, in the past which is about 5% of the contagious people. And then what happens is if you uh, answer the question a certain way, you're going to wind up uh, not being able to enter uh, or perhaps wear a mask, which is, uh, which is uh, less disruptive to your work team as well as your uh, uh, you know, paid time off and things like that. So uh, surveys and temperature screening are the best ways. Now, uh, that's because survey screening takes a minute. We take three seconds. Now, in 10 minutes, you can determine if you have COVID uh, with an antigen test. Now, that'll be $10 a person. And the time that it takes is uh, very significant to employers and employees, which is 10 minutes. And, uh, and that's only to get the answer to, do I have COVID? And we know right now that influenza spiked a month ago. It's going on. Something is going all around. I got it about a week ago, which is kind of mm. a good thing because I get to play with my temperature and uh, make a lot of measurements. Decent test. And, <laughs> and by the way, it identified me at the uh, at peak of mine, which was about 99.1 degree Fahrenheit. Uh, and it uh, it called me out. Very so uh, there are other methods, but uh, PCR is two to three hours and about $100, $150. The place that we had our PCR and all of our uh, large uh, broad study, a uh, large population study, uh, that was a hospital. And hospitals, you know, in their sleep, they, you know, can get a sample and they can give you a diagnosis uh, as to whether you have COVID or not. That's what we use to prove and to improve our uh, algorithm. So really, it sounds like as far as the options that are out there, um, whether it's very expensive being able to use a $100 or a $10 test per person or um, a survey, which doesn't seem to um, cover all the bases that it needs to cover. Um, it really seems like temperature readings and, and Willow is, is really the best course of option for um, whether that's cost effectiveness and whether that's just effectiveness in general. Yes, well, you would expect that uh, a shameless kind of advertising from yeah. uh, uh, from a promoter. Uh, I think of myself not as a promoter. Uh, yes, yeah. I mean, we are so enthused and excited about this, and we're going to get the word out in about two weeks, three weeks. We've amassed thought leaders uh, that see what this is. We have a complete uh, paper ready uh, for publication uh, in a science journal. And uh, so I have to say that uh, I, I know I'm not wrong. I know that mm -hmm. I'm spot on. And the real question is, is there people going to uh, want to get this yeah. level of workplace safety? And I think yeah. a lot of people were. We're, we have about 1500 units out in, in the world uh, and that's in the world. And uh, some of them by very large companies who put them all throughout all their manufacturing throughout the world, multinational companies. And this is what we hope to uh, take to a uh, market needing this internationally. Definitely. And, and not to, and definitely not to shamelessly plug Wello and, and make this into an advertisement because it's not, but whenever, you know, as, as, as our, our guests know, I love to have conversations with people who are, pushing the boundaries and who are truly innovating. And that's what this is. That's what Wello is. Whenever we, you know, it's a, it, it's a direct response to something that happened in, in the world that you guys have seemed to have taken the next step. Um, and which is so interesting to me. And it's so, it's so much less invasive than a COVID test, which as any, all of us know, are probably the least favorite, you know, my least favorite thing to do, maybe other than a strep throat test, um, whether it goes up your nose or down your throat, right? Um, is it's, it's, that's what's so interesting. And, and what I, I can't get off of is, is how 
it might be this simple every we've taken our temperatures for so long you know we and you get sick hey take your temperature but you guys have truly thought outside of the box and taken that next step which i just i just love so much um and, and why I wanted to have you on, Rick, to kind of talk about this. And I'm trying to pull these, pull this out of you, uh, to, not to make it seem like a, an advertisement. Can you share with us kind of, um, I, I know um, in the past we, we've talked about, can you share with us an incident where well has kind of improved employees' health and wellness? I know you talked about yourself where it already um, identified you kind of two weeks ago with the, catching the flu. Um, but could you talk about maybe an incident where well has helped improve employees' health and wellness? Sure. Um, and by the way, this uh, to talk about individual situation brings in uh, the real politic of this. And it's all because, you know, we're human beings and where we can play with where uh, I can yeah. play and measure things. You know, when I play and measure with human beings, I need all sorts of things like informed consent, you know, when we're experimenting. Um, we have uh, found uh, the latest one was we detected in the NICU, the uh, neonatal ICU, that one of our customers, we detected a person with very high fever. It was a mother who was, you know, coming in religiously as, uh, as much of the day as she could. And uh, she happened to enter that day and was not allowed to go further. And she obviously fully understood it, uh, but she was dealing with a, uh, a respiratory disease. And, uh, you know, it became more important in her mind to see her uh, her premature baby. Uh, but it, uh, it, it was obvious that her passions overcame her, uh, her rational uh, point of view. We have, uh, in uh, one of these studies, we see an outbreak occurring. And while it didn't transmit to any one of the uh, senior residents, in this particular hospital, which is full of uh, permanent senior residents, residents, uh, what we uh, did see is that A gave it to B, gave it to C, gave it to D, and each one of them had an absence profile that told you how severe it was, two days, four days, eight days, and then we could see when that individual came back. Those individuals are completely anonymous, uh, even, you know, to us, we have no information. They can reconcile it at the employer level. Uh, but all we're going to do is tell this uh, person who's not registered with our system, but badges in with it. Uh, all we're going to do is say, uh, wear a mask. You know, it's right over there. And uh, that they need to wear all day. And they need, uh, the most inconvenient part is, is they can't lunch with people because that's what we found in that outbreak that that's where it was spreading because all of those people were wearing masks. And to lunch. And, uh, and good ones too, I might add. So that became the screen door in the submarine, which is uh, which is congregating in close proximity to uh, other well people. Right, right. Well, Rick, um, uh, that is all the time we have. And I, I truly appreciate you joining us today and, and kind of sharing your insight um it's been a really it's been a pleasure kind of exploring the innovation you guys have done at wello and um your insight into the transformative power of workplace wellness and temperature readings and and the future of that and what that looks like of almost early detection um your views on kind of stopping the spread of life-threatening infections and boosting workplace illness have provided Definitely valuable pers perspectives that I think um, other listeners will can take from this, and um, that I know I that I know just listening to you that I've I've opened my eyes in a way that where um, it, it makes just perfect sense to to have these and to utilize an early detection and and temperature readings um, in workplace self uh, wellness and really just wellness in general um, across whether you're in your workplace or whether you're visiting um your grandmother in a nursing home or whether you're visiting your baby at a neonatal um unit of um that early detection system so I, I truly appreciate you um taking the time to kind of share that insight into willow and your expertise into that well i love talking about this stuff more than i like talking about myself uh but thank you very much for the opportunity to tell a story Yes, sir. Um, 
that is the time we have today. Um, you guys, please, um, please check out Rick and what Wello is doing um, in the future. Um, Rick, you said you mentioned you guys are having an announcement in in two weeks about uh, the new product. Is that correct? Right. Maybe it's a shameless well, plug be, here to end it. <laughs> there'll be webinars. Uh, I've amassed a very large uh, group of thought leaders on LinkedIn. And after that, we're going to uh, take it out to, uh, to HR, infection prevention, uh, these uh, seemingly non, uh, you know, people are not that familiar with this, uh, these areas. Uh, and that is who we will be talking to about this and anybody else who wants to uh, join in. Awesome. Well, guys, um, be on the lookout for that news from Wello here in the next few weeks. And um, Rick, thank you again for your time and uh, look forward to talking with you again here soon. Okay. Thanks, Bryce. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.